another year, another 54 new releases watched and reviewed. I'm gonna say it. I think 2023 was a pretty good year for films, in that my list of great films was longer than terrible ones when writing this video. There were a lot of mid-watches too though. Is that better than being one of the memorable worst? You tell me. I may have also managed to avoid the biggest stinkers from 2023, so do let me know in the comments if you think you found something worse than I did. Usual disclaimer that I'm going by UK release dates for these films. A moment's silence for the ones I missed because life got in the way. Once the clock hits midnight on December 31st, time's up and rankings are finalised. Spoilers will be timestamped by the way, and no spoilers at all for the best films. Anyway, enough stalling, these are my 5 worst films of 2023. Number 5. Shazam! Fury of the Gods It's all about FAMILY! FAMILY! Guys, that was a signal! We practiced this like four times! Thank you! Announcing the end of the DC Universe wasn't the best marketing tactic for this film's legacy, but that didn't stop me from checking it out. The first one was decent, so why not see how it ends? The plot of Shazam 2 is pretty straightforward. Some villains want to take over the world and the heroes must band together to stop them. The heroes being Billy Batson and his alter ego, the titular Shazam, and his foster siblings, all with their own alter egos. The villains here are old gods who just kind of show up suddenly to grab some artifacts and cause mayhem. So a big issue is the editing of the film just isn't good. This doesn't help jokes to land and overall the film just feels amateurish. Which is surprising as the same director and editor from the first film returned for this one. Another glaring problem is that Zachary Levi as Shazam and Asher Angel as Billy are playing two completely different characters, despite being two halves of one whole character. I don't know if this was a conscious choice by the actors and filmmakers or an accidental symptom of Shazam being relied on so heavily for comic relief. However, the reason this choice is so detrimental to the film's quality is because it completely undermines the emotional core of the film. Billy is struggling with feeling connected to his close-knit family because he's about to age out of the foster system and doesn't know if they'll still want him around when he does. He's terrified to address this for fear of being rebuffed, so pushes them away instead. It's an ongoing plot point for the character throughout the film and something that affects the success of the other heroes working with him. It's emotional, grounded in reality, and Asher Angel is great at portraying this during the small screen time he gets anyway. Unfortunately, no one reminded Zachary Levi that he's still playing Billy while in Shazam form. Levi instead plays an entirely disconnected character. While Billy grows and matures, Shazam regresses and makes jokes or sulks like a child half Billy's age when he doesn't get his way. It's tonal and character whiplash to go from a shot with a pensive and turmoiled Billy to a grinning and silly Shazam. To give the benefit of the doubt, it could be a way of showing how this Shazam persona allows Billy to escape his reality and hide in a disconnected, immature body. But it really doesn't come across like that was the intention. It feels like a jump from persona to persona and not a reaction to Billy's emotional distress. They just don't seem like the same person at all. This was such a common and valid complaint that the director, David F. Sandberg, added his own review on Letterboxd pointing out the criticism. While I'm amused at his self-aware self-deprecation, it doesn't make up for this pretty big oversight in the film. Anyway, let's get into spoilers. So the old gods initially want to retrieve artifacts to restore their homeworld. However, they are insulted by these kids being given godlike abilities and eventually one of them decides destroying Earth is her preferred method of vengeance. She was also probably a bit icked out by her younger sister falling for an awkward teenager 6,000 years younger than them and wanted that to kind of be over. I know I was. Even so, these villains are incredibly forgettable. Why the hell is Helen Mirren in this film 
When the filmmakers do absolutely nothing with such a well-known and accomplished actress. The film is all the more frustrating because I actually kind of enjoyed the first act. It felt intense and like the stakes were higher than the first one. And there was even a fun dream sequence for Shazam, which we'll get to later in the video. However, after that, everything slowed down and got very run of the mill. The plot was basic and didn't grip me at all. The Wonder Woman cameo at the end felt super ham-fisted and corny. Overall, Shazam 2 is a disappointing follow-up to a pretty good DC film. It's confused, lost, and creatively uninspired. I won't miss this franchise now that it's gone. Number 4. Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny Hitler made mistakes, and with this, I will correct them all. You stole it. Then you stole it. And then I stole it. It's called capitalism. The fifth film in the Indiana Jones franchise, Indiana Jones and the Dial of Destiny, follows Indy and his estranged goddaughter, Helena, trying to locate a powerful artifact before a former Nazi scientist uses it to reverse time to win the Second World War. The Indiana Jones series started in 1981, when Harrison Ford was 39. It's now 42 years later, and Ford is 81. I'm not sure how old his character is, but from what I saw in the film, there seems to be a clear divide between the actual age of the character and how he acts. It's not a Shazam problem wherein Indy acts too young and immature. In fact, Ford is, and plays, a grumpy old man. <laughs> Indiana Jones is estimated to be about 70 years old in the latest film, and he looks and feels it when he's trotting about or telling off his younger companions. But all of his actions and abilities disagree. He fights off baddies with the agility and stamina of a 25-year-old athlete. His skills have always defied his age, but this feels far too ridiculous to be believable now. Harrison Ford and Indiana Jones feel too old to still be doing this, and that is the fatal flaw when trying to make this film work. This is a twofold problem as well. It's not just the disbelief that this old guy is easily beating guys half his age without a single out of joint hip. It's that this grumpy man wants to do this at all. From the outset, Indy peels himself out of bed, sighs at his marital issues and loneliness, and repeats his tired lectures to blank-faced students. But while slowly going through the motions, I guess he's also pumping himself with age-defying drugs and adrenaline, and hitting the gym twice a day in order to hold his own against enemies that'll come out of nowhere. Despite seeming incredibly tired of the people around him and the drama they pull him into, the plot demands he take part. Harrison Ford seems tired, and I have no doubt that money is the main, if not only, reason he returned to the role. Because the film offers absolutely nothing fresh or interesting to the series. So, let's get into spoilers. Dial of Destiny tries to distance itself from the very poorly received previous film of the series, Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull, but doesn't learn anything. Kingdom was critiqued for its annoying and arrogant side character in Indy's long-lost son, Mutt. So, Dial introduces an obnoxious and smarmy side character to introduce the plot with Phoebe Waller-Bridge's Helena. And I like Waller-Bridge, so I was surprised by how much I could not stand her character here. Dial also kills Mutt off-screen to try and give Indiana an emotional arc in coming to terms with the loss of his son, but this falls so flat because this tragedy is barely addressed in an almost three hour long film. As if the filmmakers know that people didn't really like Mutt, so they tried to rush over this plot point, despite it being the emotional core of Indy's arc. It's such a waste. Indy's grief and current struggles should be an undercurrent throughout the whole film, not flimsily addressed halfway through and then tossed aside to move on to more bland action and exposition. The only scene I genuinely like is the final one, because of a surprise character appearance by Indy's estranged wife, Marion. It's the only one that felt like it had heart to it, which makes it such a shame to have it so briefly right at the end, because the rest of the film is so lifeless and formulaic. Dial of Destiny has such a disconnect from reality, and not in the usual fun Indiana Jones way. I can excuse melting faces, mind control, immortality from holy relics, 
and even time travel. But when everything turns into silly plot contrivances and lazy reveals, you've lost me. There's no great passion or inspiration behind this film. It's a lazy and underwhelming cash grab that does nothing special or different to breathe life into this dead franchise. Or into a very tired Indiana Jones that needs to retire. Insidious. The Red Door. And now, my dear friends, I'd like to dedicate this song to all of you out there. Wherever you may be, this song is for you. Speaking of reviving franchises with a waste of time, I present to you Insidious number 6. This is the third film in the franchise that focuses on the Lambert family. The first two films were about them and the second kind of concluded their story. Well, not for long, because now they're back. And we are catching up 10 years later to find out that Delton and his dad are being pulled back into the further to experience more ghostly horrors. I was actually feeling pretty positive about seeing this film leading up to its release. It's directed by Patrick Wilson, longtime actor and star of the Insidious and Conjuring films. So I hoped his experience acting in these horrors would lead him to understand what makes a good horror film, or at least what to avoid. Uh, not quite. First things first, it's not scary. <laughs> a common complaint for the horrors that feature in my worst list, but a necessary critique for a horror film. It had the usual quick jump scares and frustrating build-ups to revelations or scares that were interrupted by another character suddenly entering the room or speaking. Hate that trope. These are the lazy, cheap tricks we've all come to know and loathe. Wilson disappointingly follows the lead of his Conjuring 3 director, whose film features in my worst list of 2021. Well done there. Wherein any lights in the room are the dullest kind that only reach about 30 centimeters in distance. I hate it. And the film is so slow. Sloth levels of slow. I got really bored watching it, especially as the film really doesn't do anything fresh or interesting with the premise and takes forever to actually get started. I was an hour and 20 minutes in when I started to question what the plot of the film was. There was a ridiculous amount of setup for an extremely basic plot. But even for such an uninspired plot, it's time to dip into spoilers. So this film follows Dalton and his dad being pulled back into this dangerous ghostly realm called The Further. A mysterious red demon is really keen on trapping Dalton there and possessing his body. When the film begins, Dalton is starting college, and his father is struggling to connect with his son after splitting from his wife. So there's some family drama thrown in there too. But that's really all there is. After Dalton starts college and spooky things start happening, the film kind of meanders along very slowly while his dad thinks about how sad he is that his family is all split. And then the final act of the film is him realising Dalton's in trouble and jumping into the further to save him. I believe Wilson was trying to establish relationships and characters before jumping into the plot. Something I appreciate, but this needs to be done well. And instead this was overkill. Everything moved way too slowly. I understand that the sequel is trying to get back to the insidious roots of the franchise, but this really feels like a rehash of the original. Enter the ghostly realm and then escape. There was nothing fresh or exciting in this sequel. It doesn't even feel like a satisfying conclusion for the family because nothing about it feels final. This could have been a great ending to the family's trilogy, but ultimately just becomes a filler chapter that is pretty forgettable. Ultimately, I think Wilson did try and he does care about the franchise, but everything else, including his directorial decisions, fall far too short of the mark. Let's leave the door closed on this franchise, please. Number two. Family Switch. That's me, Cece. Mom? Wyatt? There. Let's look at a different type of horror for number two. Cringe comedy. When did Christmas become synonymous with terrible, nonsensical family films? 
If it's not Vanessa Hudgens and her estranged triplet sisters switching places to become royalty, then it's a baby switching bodies with a dog to become fully CGI. Yeah, that happens. Basically, the plot of Family Switch sees a family having a small argument, it's, it's more of a squabble than a big blowout, where they each conveniently express their wish for their parent or child to understand them better during some rare planetary alignment. And the next day they've switched bodies. Including the baby and the dog, because why not? The writing is truly abysmal and incredibly forced in order to make this overused premise work. As for the comedy, it's all just awkward encounters, boomer jokes, and comes down to plain cringe humour, with the audience cringing at the terrible writing and humour, and the main bulk of the humour coming from the writers wanting you to cringe at the characters. It is the laziest form of comedy, because everyone has to act ridiculous and the opposite of self-aware to make it work. When body switched, the characters don't even seem to try to impersonate their new body or family member. They just become caricatures of their own selves, not even the person they're pretending to be. For a rundown of how absolutely stupid this film is, it's time for spoilers. The inevitable body swap drama must have a climactic finale, so of course, each member of this family has something high stakes all on the same day. What actually feels slightly original is that the body swap family members filling in for their counterparts don't miraculously do perfectly in their new roles. In fact, they do pretty badly. Commence more cringe comedy! Although, light on the comedy. But then when the family reverts to their bodies, after realising the cliché that the ability to turn back was just to be nice to each other and understand each other, one by one, each character is inexplicably told by someone else, hey, I know you were <laughs> the worst, with this tryout slash presentation slash interview, etc. But we still want to offer you the opportunity to go further anyways. Congrats! And it's so forced and unbelievable that all I can say is, thanks, I hate it. The happy endings are entirely unearned and slapped together. As for the whole baby and dog body switching, I'm not sure if the egregious CGI was part of the joke, but wow. The comedy genre meets the horror genre in these scenes, and not in the fun way. And finally, because I would be remiss if I didn't mention it, the worst part about body swapping parents and siblings... I mean, obviously they would go there, because the only brand of comedy they're using is cringe, but do you really need to force the siblings to kiss each other in their parents' bodies, and then have a flirtatious dance scene with the parents in the kids' bodies where the audience is terrified they will kiss too? I really want to know what this film's budget was, because it looks shockingly good for such a lazy, uninspired and formulaic, uh, comedy. Why did Netflix put so much money into this? And was the money really worth it? Who sold their soul to get this film made? Can I please switch brains with someone who didn't sit through this film? Number one, The Nun 2. Sophie, what happened? There's something here that's not meant to be. What did you see? I saw none. I won't lie, I went into this film not expecting a great time. I didn't like the first, so why would I like the second? But I do really like horror films, and I try to give every film I see a chance. So I saw The Nun 2, and I hope that it would be better than the first. Yeah, it sucked. Best of 2020. Okay, <laughs> just kidding. Anyway, spoilers, but also who cares? The second Nun film sees Sister Irene and the demon nun Valak return along with Irene's friend Maurice, who secretly got possessed saving Irene at the end of the first film. The Nun 2 follows Maurice's journey across Europe, 
not noticing the mysterious trail of bodies he leaves behind him everywhere he goes, until Irene kindly points it out for him. A convenient MacGuffin in the form of a random holy relic is thrown in to try and give the characters some plot and motivation. It's the usual, powerful demon wants to be more powerful but needs this MacGuffin to do so. Not that it seems to make much difference, as the demon seems to be pretty darn powerful the whole film, and only when basically getting this MacGuffin is defeated at the end. I hate every decision the filmmakers and characters made in this film. Everyone has to be slow and take too long to figure out what's going on. Characters are introduced just to be murdered or maimed in very uninspired and ridiculous ways, with incredibly boring... (laughs) tension, leading up to a predictable jump scare. As to be expected, the Nun 2 is not scary, and it's not funny bad, it's just bad. The best, and I use that word very loosely, sequences were shown in the trailer, so the film dragged since it had very little interesting content left to show. The film thinks its slow pace and lacklustre story creates tension, but really it's padding time until the next jump scare. Once again, the director of this film and of 2021's third worst film, The Conjuring, The Devil Made Me Do It, Michael Chavez refuses to add any light to any scene, because the less lit it is, the scarier it will be, even if the lack of light is totally unnatural and doesn't make any sense. That's clearly horror directing 101. It is just so lazy and formulaic. I hate talking about this film, to be honest. It's such a waste of time and money, both for me and for the crew that made it. I just feel bad for the people involved because I'm sure they wanted to make a good horror film. It just fails on so many levels. Story, pacing, scares, lighting, characters. It's just bad. Please stop putting this man in charge of films. Best of 2023. Again, no spoilers from this point because you should check these films out. They are my top five films of 2023 after all. Number five, Dungeons and Dragons, Honor Among Thieves. We helped the wrong person steal the wrong thing. We didn't mean to unleash the greatest evil the world has ever known. But we're gonna fix it. So how do we pull that off? Uh... Figure it out over a drink? Probably best. Adapting this popular role-playing game and its intricate world into film is a no-brainer. Which is why this is not the first attempt to do so. But we try not to talk about the other attempts. I play Dungeons and Dragons, more affectionately known as D&D, so I'm already invested in the topic and have been let down by other adaptations in the past. And I am thrilled to report this is a charming, fun, and heartfelt entry in the D&D series. In short, finally we have a good one! The plot follows Edgin, a charming thief who bands together a team of unlikely heroes to retrieve a lost relic. Things quickly get out of hand and they must learn to work together to get the relic and save the day. A big mistake made so far with this series is that a lot of D&D adaptations tend to make up their own rules for their film universes. Which I think is a bit weird considering you have a vast universe of rules and lore at your disposal when adapting D&D. So I was really impressed that this adaptation actually tries to stick to the lore as much as possible, letting it slide occasionally for a worthwhile joke or forgivable plot convenience. As with real life games, the most important aspect of D&D is having fun, and I definitely had fun watching this film. The characters were well developed with their own motivations and individual abilities, and at times it felt like a great bickering cheesy D&D campaign. If you've ever played a campaign of D&D, you'll probably recognise some of the character archetypes and story beats. And that's not a bad thing. The simple plot is familiar enough to leave plenty of room for jokes, character development moments, and world lore without the film feeling bloated or overly complex. I love that the emotional core of this film is not all about romance, but about family love. A father trying to reunite with his wife and daughter after a criminal heist at the start of the film goes wrong. He is a thief after all. And he's far from perfect as he has to go through his own character development to make amends for his past. Also a small shout out to the playful attention to detail, 
one character walks away, but he's established as so confident and straightforward in his manner that as the characters keep talking, you might notice him in the background walking away in a rigid straight line, regardless of obstacles. <laughs> In conclusion, this film celebrates everything Dungeons and & Dragons, and really respects its source material. It's just a lot of fun, genuinely funny and moving at parts, and I really recommend checking it out, whether you're already a fan of D&D or know nothing about it at all. Number 4. Talk to me. Cannot go for more than 90 seconds, am I clear? What happens after 90 seconds? <laughs> Don't want to stay. Talk to me. This one stuck with me for a long while after I'd seen it. Talk to me follows Mia, a teenager recovering from the death of her mother, and her introduction to a uh, party game in her area. The embalmed hand of a dead psychic possesses the holder with a random spirit for the amusement and thrill of the holder and partygoers. As to be expected, things end up going too far. As is custom with a lot of great modern horror films, this film is multi-layered, dealing with themes of loneliness and addiction. It's not just about the tension or scares, both of which are great, but about the characters, most obviously Mia. She only really has one friend, Jade, and relies heavily on Jade and her family for emotional support, and is generally unpopular with other teenagers due to her depression and generally low demeanour. When Mia tries the hand for the first time, it sets off an excitement within her and her need for escapism that sets the film down a terrifying path. I'll be honest, the film has a couple of pretty graphic scenes, one of which I'll get to later in the video and another that had me physically wincing from the sudden violence of it. However, these scenes add to the horror and are not just used for shock value or to indulge in seeing how far the filmmakers will go in depicting violence. I just think it's fair to warn audiences that this film does not hold back, both in some of its graphic scenes and dialogue and in its emotional messages and themes. It's uncomfortable, but it really works, especially as you grow to care for the characters and what happens to them. In short, if you're looking for a horror film to leave you thinking and with a bit of a lump in your throat, it's time to watch Talk To Me. Number three, women talking. We were given two days to forgive the attackers before they returned. We hardly knew how to read or to write, but that day we learned how to vote. Do nothing. Stay and fight. Wait. Leave. This is a hard-hitting and emotive film, with a very simple but effective premise. After suffering a shocking betrayal by the men of their community, a group of women come together to decide what to do to overcome this transgression. Do nothing, stay and fight, or leave. I loved how respectful this film was, of the women's trauma, of their religion, of their experiences, all the more because this is based on a true story. Their religion and community is never named, and is kept ambiguous in a way that makes the themes and lessons taken away from this film more powerful. These women grew up in a community that is incredibly self-sufficient and intentionally cut off from the rest of the world in order to focus on their religious values. The community follows a traditional and old-fashioned gender dynamic, wherein the women are uneducated and expected to be mothers and housewives. This is why their discussion, central to the film, is so vital, and also so controversial to some of the more devout members of the community. The film is not attacking or blaming people who live this way. In fact, it demonstrates how difficult it can be to speak up and make proactive changes for the better within a tight-knit community. In the modern age, it can also be difficult to understand why these women would accept this lifestyle and treatment by other people. I know it's certainly not something that makes sense to me, but through tight storytelling and a fantastic script, it starts to make sense. And it's heartbreaking. The script touched on a lot of sensitive topics with a respect and thoughtfulness that I enjoyed and appreciated, never needing to go graphic or shocking to deliver the heavy implications of their discussions. Their words are enough. It's hard to watch at times, especially with certain revelations from characters. The women don't have all the answers, 
but they do what they believe is right, whether it is the best resolution or not. The film is so powerful in depicting the importance of women coming together and being able to share and confide, and what a difference simply communicating with each other can make. Women talking should not be ignored. Number 2. Oppenheimer We're in a race against the Nazis. And I know what it means if the Nazis have a bomb. I didn't expect to, but I really love this. Oppenheimer tells the story of the man behind the invention of the atomic bomb, more commonly known as the nuclear bomb. The film takes place at key points in Oppenheimer's life, fleshing out the man who would create a bomb powerful enough to end the Second World War, but also introduce the world to a weapon so powerful it could eventually mean the end of our world itself. Killian Murphy is phenomenal as the titular character of J. Robert Oppenheimer. He carries this three-hour epic on his back. You can feel the weight of his decisions in his performance and dialogue effortlessly. He is fantastic at portraying Oppenheimer's journey from an anxious student to the brain behind Earth's greatest weapon, until his eventual realization and remorse at the monster he's unleashed. The film is obviously a character study of J. Robert Oppenheimer throughout the development of the atomic bomb, and Murphy is perfectly cast in the role, with his on-point gravitas and understanding of the character and human. His performance is surrounded by other great performances and brilliant filmmaking, not least the impressive use of practical effects in simulating the atomic tests. Despite the length, the film feels well-paced, and moves carefully from one historical moment to the next. It's definitely a film which needs your full attention to follow all the intricate details and developments of such an intense project. I appreciated the attention to detail in telling this complex story because it made the experience all the more enthralling for me. This is no small story to tackle. There's a lot to it. As an aside, I do question a little bit why Florence Pugh had to be nude for 70% of her screen time and the point of that, but otherwise I really enjoyed her performance. This is an explosive and emotive epic of a film, and one you should definitely watch to understand just how one man's work has changed the future of the entire world forever. Special Mentions The Creator What do you want, sweetie? For robots to be free. Oh, we don't have that in the fridge. How about ice cream? Set in the future, a man is tasked to destroy the secretive AI enemy leader in an ongoing war. But when he finds this advanced AI in the form of a young child, he is led down a difficult path of questioning everything about his own morals and this war. The creator is incredibly well made, with good layered storytelling. There are some very powerful religious and geopolitical parallels that spark interesting conversation. Even if that doesn't really interest you, I recommend checking it out for the stunning visuals, gorgeous sets, and astonishing world building. May, December. A 36 year old woman have an affair with a seventh grader. People, they like see me as a victim. I wanted- Years after their scandalous, under their scandalous underage affair rocked the nation, a couple is approached by an actress to learn more about them for the film adaptation of their story. May December's phenomenal cast elevates this drama and character study, especially Charles Melton as Joe. Melton is a revelation in the role and his emotional journey in the film as the now grown up grooming victim is shocking and very well acted. This is a film about exploitation and manipulation and the surprising twists and turns in the plot make this a film worth seeing. Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 We'll all fly away together. Into the forever. And beautiful sky. Proving not all superhero films coming out recently are fated to crash and burn, Guardians of the Galaxy's final film in its trilogy is a triumphant, albeit brief, return to form for the MCU. The film primarily focuses on Rocket Raccoon being confronted with his creator and the trauma from his past. The story also provides room for the rest of the Guardians to figure themselves out and the next steps in their lives, beyond the family. It's 
It's an emotional, captivating and mature farewell to the group as we currently know them. It feels like an appropriately epic finale for the team. And now, number one, Godzilla minus one. I'm not a big fan of the Godzilla character or lore. I can't remember much of the 1999 version, and the 2014 reboot was okay when Brian Cranston was on screen. But those are the American versions, where nowadays Godzilla tends to become a pseudo-protector of Earth by the third act. This version is straight from the Japanese source, and acts as a prequel of sorts, beginning its story in 1945. It's subtitled and was made for much less money than the American versions before it, which is so impressive considering the final product. The film follows Koichi's Shikichima, a failed kamikaze pilot trying to recover from the horrors of the Second World War in a decimated Tokyo. Unfortunately, not only does he and the people of Japan have to deal with the fallout of the war, but now a terrifying creature has emerged to wreak even more havoc on their lives. It's interesting that two big films in 2023 deal with nuclear war and its fallout, although Godzilla is much more focused on the fallout. And it's the monster movie that sticks with me more. Godzilla Minus One blends reality and fiction beautifully. It also highlights how little I knew about the fallout of the war on Japan. Not just the bombing on Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but the fact that Tokyo was leveled. And about all the humans affected by this in different ways. The fictional monster of Godzilla is placed smack bang in the middle of the harsh reality of post-war Japan, and it is heartbreaking to watch the horrors unfold. It's not just about the monster's carnage, but how the PTSD of each character plays out, people banding together in the worst of circumstances, and the difficulty of moving on from the past to a hopefully better future. It's a monster film about humans and humanity. Godzilla is still a fantastic antagonist and central point of the film. He is the reason for the plot, but he also represents so much more than that. Japan's recent history and their future, their fear, their trauma. It is incredibly emotional, but also incredibly exciting. Fans looking for a straightforward monster disaster film will be thrilled because the visual effects are amazing and the disaster and action sequences are intense and extremely well done and fans looking for a deeper experience will be rewarded with intensely moving sequences rooted in reality and really well-developed characters that you actually care about. I really love the characters and their complexities and emotional journeys. So if you're looking for an all-round fantastic action film with plenty of depth and impact, you need to check out Godzilla Minus One, the best film of 2023. Hey, you stuck around after the credits! Well, normally there's not much else here, but have I got a treat for you? This year was a strange one for films because some of them got quite the visceral reaction from me, almost begging the film not to go there. But they did. And it actually kind of worked in context. But these moments have haunted me ever since. And therefore, we have a new addition to this year's ranking because film in 2023 got wild. Top five WTF film moments in 2023. The movie title is gonna go first so you can skip forward to the next one if you don't want me to ruin the shock of the film you plan to watch. I'm gonna avoid showing a lot of the explicit footage in this section if possible because I really don't want my video to be instantly age restricted so you might have to guess from some blurred clips. Or you can watch the films and you'll definitely know what I'm talking about. Anyway. Number five, Shazam! Fury of the Gods. Wizard Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman in blackface, <laughs> but also not quite. 
I think I laughed for a full minute at the sheer absurdity of this sequence. I don't remember a word the characters said either. Number four, talk to me, puppy love. A great warning against overindulging in mind-altering substances for most, but also grossly disturbing in showing just how much these spirits are able to possess and screw with their hosts during these crazy parties. Don't touch psychic hands, kids. Or innocent family pets. Number three. Salt burn. Bath time. In the moments beforehand, you see it coming. But you're begging the film not to, because who wants to see that? But then it happens, generously shown in vivid close-ups of the bath drain. And you understand just how far the film is willing to go to show the utter desperation and obsession of Barry Keoghan's character. And that's not even the craziest thing he does in Saltburn. So let's move on to... Number two. Saltburn. Graveyard Grief. Major spoilers for the end of the film here. But when Kyogen's Oliver fails to act on his lust for Jacob Elordi's Felix, he opts for the next best thing, I guess. Watching him kiss, cradle, touch, and uh, consummate with Felix's grave was a truly major WTF moment. However, the next moment still tops this chart, possibly for the next decade. And now, number one, Bo is Afraid, Father-Son Reunion. Bo is Afraid is a big WTF film. The whole film is filled with moments that could fit this list. But instead of doing that, I think it's Bo meeting his penis monster father in his mother's attic that tops the list for me. I mean, you think the film couldn't get any wilder, and then you watch disembodied giant genitals scream and stab a man in the head. That stays with a person. Happy 2024!